said, this is David's son. Then David came with 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow David, and who had been left at the brook Besor. And they went out to meet David, and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near to the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David said, because they do not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we will possess except that each man may leave away his wife and children and his house. But David said, You shall not do so, my lord, until the Lord has given us food and drink and raiment, and given us into our hand the bands that come against us. Who would listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down into battle, so shall his share be who stays by the bed. They shall share alike. And he made it a statute and a rule for Israel from that day forward to this day. When David came to Ziklag, he sent part of the spoil to his friends, the elders of Judah, saying, Here is a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. It was for those in Bethel, in Ramah, the Negev, and in Abdul, in Aram, in Sikemoth, in Eshtemoa, in Rapha, in the cities of the Jerimoth, cities of the Kenites, in Hormah, in Borishan, in Japheth, in Hebron, in all the places where David and his men had gone. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessing on our time tonight as we look at your word. We ask that you would impress upon us that which you would have us to know and that you would modify our hearts and minds by it. We ask as well that you would help us to see how you have provided for us in so many different ways. And we ask, ultimately, that you would help us to be more like Christ from having been here. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. So we're looking at uh, chapter 30 tonight of 1 Samuel. And we're nearing the end of 1 Samuel. And as we do, that which has really been brewing all along in the book of 1 Samuel is coming more to a head and becoming more apparent. That being the contrast between David and Saul. Uh, And as you saw... Last night, uh, last time when Tommy took you through chapter 29, David's off doing some things, Saul's off doing some things, and really this is going on concurrently. I know we're reading these things in succession, and we have a week or so in between each one, but you get the feel from the author that these are two things that are going on. They're both go off, and they're fighting, and they're doing some things, and, and in the midst of that, you have this story of David. David comes back from dealing with the area of the Philistines, and when he comes back, something that they discover, and it's something that, of course, will cause them great consternation. And so we're going to break this down as we continue to look at really the question that's being asked throughout the book of 1 Samuel, and that is, who is qualified to lead God's people? Who is qualified to lead God's people? Because one of the primary things you come away with in the book of 1 Samuel is how they got a monarchy. Remember the book of Judges? There was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And God would raise up a deliverer or a judge or a warlord from time to time, defeat the bad guys after they had repented, but then they would go back into the cycle again. And it helps us to see how they go from a judge, for example, Samuel, how they make that transition to the monarchy. And they go to Saul, and as we know, Saul has issues, and so he fails in chapter 13. He fails again in 15. And so because of this, God is going to tear away the kingdom from him and give it to him, someone after his own heart, which we, of course, know is David. But we're dealing with the tension because David has been anointed as king, but he's not reigning as king. And so we have a king who is Saul, and we see him as flawed. Now, we recognize David is not without his flaws as well, but there's a contrast that goes on, and we'll talk more about that as we get through the text. So I want to kind of walk through the text, and we'll look at five different sections here in the text and try to make sure we understand what's going on in each one, say a few things about it, and then again, we'll draw forth some ideas, some thoughts, and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. So if you have thoughts, write them down, questions, comments, concerns, and we'll deal with those as we move along. So first, we want to look at verses 1 through 6, verses 1 through 6. Tommy told me I have to have a cute little saying for each section, so this one is called plundered, plundered. Uh, Verses 1 through 6, plundered. So 
They come back, and lo and behold, when they get back to Ziklag, things are not well. And they've left Ziklag as kind of their home base. They've left their families there. They've left their stuff there as they've been out traipsing around the area. And then when they come back to Ziklag, they find... Verse 1, when David and his men came to Ziklag, on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire. So you walk up, if you will, and you see the place. The place has been burnt with fire. You want to ask somebody what happened? There's nobody there. Continue, verse 4, and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them. Pause for a moment. We know that. They don't know that, right? There's no sign that says, by the way, here's your forwarding address. We've taken them with us. We'll bring them back later. Nothing like that. So imagine you come back on your, on your village, and there's nothing there except remains, ashes, maybe a little smoldering, and there's nobody there. What happened? What's going on? You really don't know. Well, this is what they happen upon at this particular point in time. Now, we don't know if this is particular retaliation against David. The Amalekites are upset with him back in chapter 27, uh, verse 8. You had an issue in the Amalekites, chapter 27, verse 8. David and his men went up and made raids against the Gersherites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites. For these were inhabitants of the land from of old, as far as sure to the land of Egypt. So it could be retaliation. It could just be, you get the impression as this text unfolds, that they had been out moving around from place to place, and Ziklag was their last stop at this point, and then they were going to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, the bad guys, if you will, the Amalekites, and perhaps it was retaliatory or it just happened to be opportunistic. But I kind of get the feel that they know David is off doing this and Saul's off doing this, and so there's an unprotected spot there, and they go and they take advantage of it. So David and his folks show up, and indeed, the non-combatants, they haven't been killed, but they have been abducted. They have been taken away. And so they wonder, what happened to them? The place has been burned, but they're not. One commentator says, at best, at best, they will become slaves. They will be worked hard, cruelly treated, sold off somewhere perhaps. At worst, no one wanted to consider this, right? So... You can imagine what they're feeling at this point in time. The text gives you some serious insight into this. Verse 3, David and his men came to the city. They found it burned with fire, their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So they respond as you might expect. Verse 4, David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. So they didn't just say, let's go mad, let's go get them. They stop down and they weep for an extended period of time to the point where it wears them out. They actually have no more tears, no more strength left to weep at this point. Included in this, the king-to-be, David's two wives as well. Verse 5, his two wives had also been taken, the Hinnom of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. So, of course, David as well is deeply distressed. Now, it's interesting, we go through on Wednesday nights at our prayer meeting, we go through and we spend some time going through a psalm each week. And you get a lot of David sharing what's going on in his mind and in his heart, which is always fascinating because David is a man of valor. He's a mighty man of war. He's a man of blood, in fact. He's lauded as one, although Saul had killed his thousands, David had killed his tens of thousands. But David, in the psalms, is happy enough to be very vulnerable at times. And we'll talk about those who have surrounded him, and he's in despair and all he can do is cry out to the Lord. And a lot of times you have instances where it tells you what he's going through. He's hiding in the cave from Psalm, or he's on the run from Absalom, or whatever the situation's going on. But sometimes you don't. And here you have what may very, very well feed into some of that, where you have those in his own time of despair who are conspiring against him as well, because he's in mourning himself, but watch how things turn on him. Verse 6, David was greatly distressed. Because the people spoke of stoning him, each for his son, excuse me, uh, him because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. So this is the situation. David, of course, is sad because he's got his own issues to deal with, and now they're thinking of stoning him. Well, it's not perhaps without reason. I mean, David is leading them through where the places they are going. David was the one who encouraged them to go and bring them into the land of Philistines back in chapter 27. Uh, it was David's request that they live in this remote spot here 
in Ziklag back in chapter 27, 5 and 6. It's David who leads them off to fight against the Philistines and so, and so forth, leaving their families unprotected and unguarded. Now, we don't know if they had a discussion about this or whatnot, but nonetheless, when you're the leader, attitude reflect leadership, they reflect to him what they're feeling and thinking at that particular point in time. And so they're angry to the point of thinking of stoning David. Now, this cannot be because David's supposed to be the king. So he can't be killed, at least not at this point, because he's not even been the king yet. But this is the situation in which he finds himself. His own friends, his own loyal, so to speak, folks that are with him, they're not just thinking about it. They're speaking of stoning him. So to what does David uh, find himself doing he turns, of course, to the Lord. Verse 6, But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And this is where I say, if you read through a lot of the Psalms, this is a lot of what David talks about. The times of despair, what should I do? I can trust nobody else, but he can trust in the Lord. He can find strength in the Lord. And that is, of course, what he does. So this is the situation. They're plundered. The people are talking of stoning David. David seems to be the one with the level head and in the midst of this plundered uh, scenario, he finds him strengthening in the Lord. So move from that to the second section, verses 7 through 10. Verses 7 through 10, we go from plundered to planning. Planning. All right, we've cried, we've wept, till we have nothing left to weep. We have no more strength. What do we do now? What's our plan? How are we going to deal with this? They've gone. They didn't leave a forwarding address. So what are they going to do? David, verse 7 David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. This is not the first time we've encountered Abiathar. Uh, you may recall Abiathar was one of the few priests who had escaped when Doeg tried to kill off all of the priests back in chapter 22. He had ran away and he had brought the ephod there to David when 80 of the priests of the Lord had been killed by Doeg. So he consults with Abiathar and wants him to bring the ephod. Now, that's code for we need to seek the Lord's guidance. It's essentially what that is. So the idea of the ephod is you had, in, with the ephod, you had the Urim and Thummim, and you, they would use these things, and quite honestly, we don't know exactly how, but they would use these things with the ephod to try to discern what it is that the Lord would have them to do. And so this was the way they would consult the Lord. On some level, how David wants to consult the Lord is not nearly as important as the fact that he does consult the Lord. And you'll see why I say that, because we're going to draw a contrast to Saul in just a wee bit. But David wants to consult the Lord. He is going to seek God's favor and God's will in this situation. Now, what's interesting, I, I admit that you guys probably don't spend as much time in 1 Samuel as Tommy and, uh, and Jeremy I do. But it's been since chapter 23 that David has sought the will of the Lord. He hasn't sought the will of the Lord for a while. That's been absent up to this point. Also, it's not been since chapter 26 that he mentions the name of the Lord. So there's a bit of a change that takes place where he gets, after finding his strength in the Lord in verse 6, he's confident to go and seek the Lord and brings in Abiathar and seeks this through him, through the Urim and Thummim. It's kind of like a recognition that there's no such thing as chance in their scenario, right? So if it comes up one or the other, God has helped them to see that that's the case. It's very similar to Proverbs 16, 33, right? The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Kind of like if we were to say the dice, right? There's no such thing as the randomness, really. Everything that happens, every little molecule in the universe governed by the sovereignty of God and his providence so that even things like that, God would use to communicate to them. Now, the peril in that is trying to discern those kind of things and reading the tea leaves in our world and day, but we, of course, have the scriptures to guide us. But this is the way God had set up for them to seek him and to seek what it is he would want for them to do. And so this is what he does. He seeks the Lord through bringing Abiathar. Verse, back to verse 7. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David, and David inquired of the Lord in verse 8. Simple question. Shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? Now, it's interesting because David is not a coward. He is a courageous individual. David is not afraid that he could go up against them and they might be too scary. He fought Goliath, right? He's fought the bear and the lion. He's not worried about this. But nonetheless, before just out of vengeance and just getting mad and hopping mad and just chasing off after them, he consults the Lord. What would the Lord have 
me, and then subsequently, of course, us do in this particular scenario. So he consults the Lord to find out what God would have him to do. Should I go after them? Should we pursue them? And the Lord answers. He answered him, pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and shall surely rescue. So keep that in mind. He inquires of the Lord, gets a very positive and very favorable uh, response from the Lord. Verse 9. So David set out and the 600 men who were with him. This is the band that he has. This is the same group, or at least the same number of folks that he had back in chapter 25, you may recall. And even then, they had a group of 400 and a group of 200. And we'll see how that plays out here also. But he sets out with his 600 folks, and they are with him. They came to the brook Besor, where they who were with him, excuse me, where those who were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and the 400 men, 200 stayed behind who were too exhausted to cross the brook Besor. Now, before we give them the business, you got to put our thoughts into where they are, right? They've been off fighting. They come back. They're already worn out. They're looking for a little R&R back at the home base, but instead they weep. They're worn out, and now they're moving again, and they get to the brook, and these guys are just exhausted. They're spent. On one hand, you could think they probably wouldn't be worth a whole lot in battle if that's the case. And as we're traipsing along, if you've ever been hiking, you know you hike at the rate of the slowest hiker, right? These folks would hold them behind. And plus, if they stay behind, they can watch the baggage, they can watch the things, and then what? We don't have to take everything with us. We can leave everything except our accoutrement, if you will, i.e. our weaponry. So nonetheless, they're going to leave these folks there. 200 stayed behind, verse 10, too exhausted to cross the brook. So we'll come back to those guys Moving to the next section, verses 11 through 15. 11 through 15, providence, providence. We go from plundered, and then we have planning in verses 7 through 10, and now providence. Verse 11, they, and if I could insert, just happened to found an Egyptian in the open country and brought him to David. And they gave him bread, and he ate. Now, the reason we're going to give him bread and something to eat and drink is because he is worn out and exhausted and he's been left for dead. So he ate, they gave him water to drink. Verse 12, they gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. It's interesting how detailed they get into what he actually gets to eat from them, right? I mean, it's not just they gave him a little something because he was near death and we're being a good Samaritan. Even in the story of the Good Samaritan, you don't get a lot of detail as to what he eats and drinks, right? So here it goes on to a little bit of detail, and I think I have an idea why that might be, but a lot of detail into what's going on here. So we know they're going to go forth, and we know what's happened. They meet a guy. Now, this is important because, again, we know what happened. We know the Amalekites came through. We know the Amalekites burned the place down. We know the Amalekites have abducted all of the people and ran away. They don't know that. They really don't know who they're chasing after. They don't know how many. They don't know what the situation is up to this point. But the Lord has told them, despite their ignorance and perhaps their concerns and maybe even fear, go and basically you will pursue them and be victorious. So they find this chap and they feed him and kind of nurse him back to health. Begin in verse 12, when he had eaten, his spirit revived, for he had not eaten bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. David said to him, to whom do you belong, and where are you from? Now, indulge me for just a moment. You're already a little concerned about David. You've talked about stoning David, and David says, lads, get up, let's go, we're going to go again. And you're taken off, and you trek down to Besor. 200 of them say, I'm out, that is, that's too much, I can't go free. So now you're thinking, okay, rah, rah, let's go get the bad guys. And then you stop down, and I don't know how long this takes, but if you're nursing a guy who's near death, who hasn't eaten or drinking anything, in three days, and you're stopping down and giving them all this food, I got to imagine somebody in the group is saying, Man, we're burning daylight here. I mean, let's, can we bring him with us? Can we come back to him? What is the deal with this Egyptian? Because remember, at this point, we know what they don't know, that this is a very providential encounter. God has provided for them the necessary information that they need. So we realize it before they do. And so he asks him, to whom do you belong? Where are you from? The young man says, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. They don't like the Amalekites. And my master left me behind because I fell sick three days ago. Left him behind by himself. You get the idea that he left him, of course, 
to die. He fell sick, and he was of no use to them at that point. So we had made a raid against the Negev of the Cherethites and against that which belongs to Judah and against the Negev of Caleb, burned Ziklag with fire. Now, we also know what he doesn't know, and that's that Ziklag that you burned, that's what these guys, that was their place, right? So he may not realize, you may not be putting two and two together at this point, but you can almost see the guys going, aha, well, this is interesting. Now, you might think, let's kill the guy, because that would be getting a little bit of our own vengeance and a little bit of uh, this out of our system. And so he says, we burned Ziklag with fire. Verse 15, David said to him, will you take me down to this band? In other words, can you show me where they are? Can you help me find uh, this group of individuals? And so you've got these folks uh, who are looking to wreak vengeance and re- looking also, to be quite honest, to get their family members back. Their family members have been taken, kidnapped and been absconded with. And so he's going to see if they can get some information out of this guy to help them find where it is they need to go. So you're not going to hear, interestingly enough, from these Amalekites after this instance. And so God is going to use even this Egyptian in a very central sort of way in his providence to disperse them. But we'll get to that as we go along. But you need to see God providing this instant, is in particular instance for them where you have David who comes along as kind of a good cop as opposed to a bad cop scenario. They ask him some questions, but they don't torture him in the interrogation. They don't waterboard him. And so they feed him and they give him drink and they ask him, will you help us find our way along? And then he says to them, Verse, uh, back to verse 15. He said, Swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this band. So he's kind of in a precarious situation. He's burned the house and everything of these guys, and he's been a party to what they did at Ziklag. Uh, and yet if he helps them, then he's going to be on the naughty list with the Amalekites as well. So he's kind of in a rock and a hard place wedged in there at this point in time. So, obviously, there's an agreement that takes place, and we'll move to verses 16 through 20. Verses 16 through 20, he is going to help them find where they need to go. Verses 16 through 20, we have payback, payback, payback in verses 16 through 20. When he had taken him down, behold, they were spread abroad over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing. So he doesn't find them sharpening their swords. He doesn't find them about to go for another raid. This is their denouement, if you will. They are relaxing. They are enjoying their spoils. They're having a good time. And they are going to be in no real good condition. They've been getting fattened up, if you will. As you know, a full meal makes for a slow mongoose, right? They're going to have full bellies. And they're maybe drank a little bit too much as well. (laughs) There will be no match for David and his 400 men. Especially because... They have the Lord on their side, and the Lord told them to go and make this happen. So this is what they're going to do. So they get the guidance, and clearly they have implied, at least, that they are not going to kill the Egyptian in this scenario. And so in verse 16, they came, and they see them all sprawled out, not tightly together. If you ever see the old westerns, what do they do when the bad guys are coming, or the good guys, they circle the wagons and all kind of huddle together, right? Well, they're all spread out. I mean, you could easily go through there and divide and conquer and wipe these folks out. So they see them this way. They got all of the spoil, all of the great spoil, it says, that they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. Again, so these guys have been out raiding places, and it seems like the last stop up to this point was Ziklag. So this is important because they raided all this other stuff, and they not only have the things that they picked up in Ziklag, they have the other things that they picked up along the way as well, from the land of Judah and from the land of the Philistines. So these unsuspecting folks are about to get a rude awakening, and they get routed. Verse 17, David struck them down from the twilight until evening of the next day, and not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who mounted camels and fled. So God provides this Egyptian, and in the process, as you know, God has been unhappy with the Amalekites for centuries. And so Saul, what was his big mess up back in chapter 15? He did not extinguish all of the Amalekites like he was supposed to, right? He, in fact, kept Agag, the king, alive. And this is where you get the situation where he is going to be robbed of the kingdom, so to speak. He does it to himself in that scenario, uh, but David will take the kingdom from him. Only he's going to wait, of course, for the Lord to put it into his hands rather than what used to happen 
back in the day was you became king by killing the other king. But in this particular scenario, now you see that they've gone through and they have killed them, except these 400 who happen to run off on the camels. And again, we won't hear from the Amalekites until the time of King Hezekiah. So they're kind of off the map, so to speak, for quite some time. So they take off and they run away. They are indeed routed. It is a complete victory, but in verses 18 and 19, you might have been wondering, well, what happened to the people? It's a complete victory, but it's also a complete recovery. Verse 18, David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken, and David rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoils or anything that had been taken. David brought back all. It's a very repetitive, uh, emphatic way to try to say, look, everything that wandered off from Ziklag, they brought back. Whether it was a person or whether it was stuff, they brought it all back. David brought back all. So when God says, go ahead, and verse 8, he goes, pursue, for you shall overtake them and you shall surely rescue. He does indeed rescues and gets everything back as well. So they have all that there's there, but there's the bonus because they've been off raiding in other areas of Judah and areas of the Philistines. Verse 20, David also captured all the flocks and herds. And the people drove the livestock before him and said, this is David's spoil. Now, it's interesting. David is the king, but not yet the king, right? So, but he's got a, a situation where he is the leader of this group, but he's not really the king yet. It would make more sense if he already was the king, because if you're the king and you go off into battle, to the victor go the spoils, and the king can dole these things out as he sees fit. This will be in the next section when question comes up as to, how do we allocate the extra stuff? I mean, every, everybody gets what was his or hers. You give everything back their stuff, but what about the extra things? How do you deal with that? And so we go from the payback to verses 21 through 31 with plunder distribution, plunder distribution. They had been plundered, but now they plundered, and they have to distribute the plunder. This plunder distribution. How are they going to give it all back? Verse 21. David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow David and who had been left at the brook of Besor. And they went out to meet David, to meet the people who were with him. It's a homecoming and a warm, happy reunion at this particular point. When David came near to the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked and worthless fellows, which is never what you want to be called in the Scripture, but we hear this from time to time. The wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David said, now you'll get the context, this, this is among the 400. So of the 400, some of these guys who are wicked and worthless, they say to David, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we had recovered, except that each man may lead away his wife and his children and depart. So any of the extra stuff we got, now, it gets a little confusing. Is, is all of the extra stuff from the Philistines' lands and from the Judah, is that all for David? And when they say you can't even have the things that you had before, in other words, your property, not just your stuff. Either way, whatever's going on here, David doesn't like it because they're trying to slight the 200 that didn't go with them. Whether that's fair or not is going to be, of course, up to your own perspective in this particular scenario. So in other words, you got 600 folks. Do you, do, and do you have the division among the 400 who were the valiant fighters, the warriors, the courageous ones who had the stamina and who weren't too tired to go off and fight? Or do you say, we're all on the same team, everybody gets a trophy, even the guy who rides the pine, right? I mean, is this the question that you have going on there? So they're thinking, no, David, this doesn't work this way. This is battle, right? This isn't Little League we're going to go, and the ones that fight, they get the stuff. But David is going to have none of it. Verse 23, but, it's a contrasting conjunction. David said, you shall not do, do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. That's the key thought for David. All of the stuff we have, the victory, everything that we have is because God has given it to us. We didn't earn it. We didn't become victorious and grasp it away from anybody else. We may have looked that way or felt that way, but what we have, God has given to us. So all that we have, God has given to us. Everything that's in our hands, God has given it to us. He has preserved us and given into our hand the band that came against us. So the reason we have any of these things is not because of our own prowess or preparation. 
but because of the providing of God who provides this victory for us. So he's trying to educate them along the way. He doesn't perhaps have to. He could just say, no, that's not what we're going to do. I'm in charge here. You'll listen to me. But he's trying to explain to them, and I think subsequently he's explained to us as well, what's going on here, that any victory, of course, has been brought by God. So verse 24, who would listen to you in this matter? For as his share is, who goes down into the battle, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage. In other words, whether you're among the 400 who went off and fought or among the 200 who stayed with the baggage, everybody gets the same share. Everybody gets the same. So shall his share be, he says. They shall share alike and share alike. He makes clear this is what's going to happen. We're all going to benefit equally. We're all on the same team. We're all going to benefit here. You have the situation where if you want to use the, the jargon of our day, you have your combat troops and you have your combat support, and they're both necessary to the mission, and they're all going to benefit, and they're all going to have the same flag and the same bounty that they will share together as well. But not all of it. You see that David would take some of that plunder, and he is going to distribute it elsewhere also. He is going to share among some of the lands of Judah and some of the elders and some of the folks there. Some of these places, we, we don't know exactly they are. Some of these places may have been places that they had um, been sacked or they had lost some stuff along the way, but we see David sp uh, passing out some of the spoil, distributing some of the plunder. Verse 26, when David came to Ziklag, he sent part of the spoil to his friends, the elders of Judah, saying, here is a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. And so it talks about the different places that he passed them along. In verse 31, it makes it clear all the places where David and his men had roamed. So they had a connection, they had a relationship with the particular folks in that area. And so he gave some things back to them. Could very well be that he feels a certain sense of uh, obligation is probably not the right word, but connection because ultimately and very soon he is going to be the king of that area. And so he feels a sense of uh, paternalistic um, concern and care for them when he would do this. But Again, may have been that some of these folks had experienced some of the uh, business end of the Amalekites coming through. We don't know exactly what's going on here, but we see him being generous with that which God had been generous to him. At least this is his perspective along the way. And so you've got the situation that he is, I would submit to you, recognizing here, and I guess verse 6 really says this specifically, uh, that these are the enemies of the Lord. The Amalekites are the enemies of the Lord. Not the enemies of David so much. David's dealing with them because they're enemies of the Lord. And this is important, I think, and important to us to realize as well. It's not a vendetta. It's not vengeance. He's not that I'm going to go and kind of fly off the handle and I'm going to teach them a lesson so that they will fear David. Nothing like that. These are the Lord's enemies. And we go off and, as we see many places in Scripture, God is using his people to bring about his particular mission. And so he is going to include the vengeance uh, side of this that perhaps guys often we're uh, adhering to. He's going to use it for his own purposes. But David's mindset is if they're the Lord's enemies, they are going to be his enemies. And you pick that up in the Psalms as well. Uh, David doesn't hold grudges, but David realizes he does the Lord's work where God sends him. And it goes back to verse 8. Shall I go after them? Shall I pursue them? And God makes it very clear to him in verse 8. Pursue, for you shall surely overtake, and you shall surely rescue. And that's exactly what he does. So he all the stuff that had been lost, he brings it back. All that was gone from Ziklag, the place is still burnt down to the ground, but they have all these things that are brought back at this particular point in time. A couple of quick thoughts before we have time of Q&A, and then we'll read the chapter again. First, I do want to, hopefully I kind of stress this as we went through, so I don't have to spend so much time on it, but it is very interesting, the providential nature of just delivering this Egyptian right in their path. Again, they don't really know where they're going. This, this trail is not as hot as you might think. And so they're following along. They don't know exactly what they're looking for, where we're going, what we're doing here. And in God's providence, he drops this Egyptian into their lap who is very needy and yet very knowledgeable uh, to help them. And he provides the way for them to do what God wants, for God to deal with his enemies using his king elect in the process. And again, dealing with the Amalekites such that you don't hear from them again for quite some time. Second thing we've talked about, I want to make sure we get this as well, is that the, uh, these victories are from the Lord. Not just military victories, but any kind of victory. I mean, even if you get a raise at your job, it's something that God does. If we happen to be blessed by God and we get a new building, it's something that God has done. God does these things 
for us. And it's really easy. We're not careful to start to think that we're doing something that's so great and so wise and we're better than everybody else and we're better than this church or that church or whatever the case may be. Paul mentions this in 1 Corinthians 4. Uh, for who sees anything different in you? Now, Paul's context is those that are kind of boasting about the things that they've done in the past, but he says, what do you have that you didn't receive? If you then received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Well, David understands that concept. We have a victory, we received it from the Lord. And as such, it's the Lord's victory, it's the Lord's spoils, we will do with those things as he would have us to do and such. And so it's a good thing for us to remember everything that we have if we have money in the bank individually or as a church, all those so-called victories we have are from God's hand. He provides them for us. A third, and this kind of goes back to the 400, we have to be careful. There's the danger of this idea of fairness, the danger of the idea of fairness. Now, kids pick up on this a lot of times, and you've probably, if you've been a parent, heard kids say, that's not fair, right? Whether it's Johnny down the road gets to do something that I'm not allowed to do or big sis or little sis gets to do something or whatever it is, that's not fair. And we can easily fall into that sort of trap too. We say, well, you, you were naughty and the other one was good, but we'll give you both a cookie or whatever it is. It's easy for us to get into the that's not fair type thing. And again, you have the situation where you know, people play for sports teams or whatever and somebody may be the star on the team and other people may not really do a whole lot. Is it fair that they get the same trophy or the same medal or whatnot? It's a great question, but it happens even in church where it's beyond things like trophies and medals and such. And we have to remember God disperses things as, of course, he sees fit in his goodness. I mean, is it right that some people give a lot of money to church and some people don't give very much at all? And they get to sit in the same kind of pew. I mean, wouldn't it make more sense that if you gave more, you got a fancier pew and you had your name inscribed on it? This has happened in the history of the church, by the way, through the centuries. I'm not advocating that, mind you, but let me just be clear. But, but sometimes we feel that sort of way. It's like, well, some people really work hard, and they serve the church a lot, and other people don't serve so much. I mean, should they all be allowed to drink coffee? I mean, coffee is for closers, right? I mean, should, shouldn't you have to earn your coffee or whatever the case may be? I say that, hopefully, somewhat you pick up on it in jest, but the reality is, if we're not careful, and I'm talking to the spiritually mature people who are heavily involved in church and who do a lot of things, if we're not careful, we can look around and say, I do a lot more than those other folks do, and yet it doesn't seem like I get any benefit to that from having done so. We're all on the same team. We get the same blessings that come from God along the way. Before we start to think and talk to God about what is fair and what is not fair, we have to remember, of course, that everything we do is for Him and from by Him, and everything we have is from Him as well. And so different people have different capacities to serve. They have different times of life, different periods of life where they have more than they can give or more than they can do, and whatever the case may be. The key is for us to carpe our own diem, if you will, right? You seize your own day as you can, when you can, along the way, trusting the Lord to do what is right in His eyes for you. And so we have to be careful that we don't fall into the trap of these 400, thinking that those lesser 200, whatever that may be, are going to be those who... Uh, encroach upon the things that only we deserve. Not advocating anybody be a slacker, mind you, uh, but recognize we do what we can when we can, and there are no boasting rights. Again, going back to 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Everything we have, of course, is from the Lord. And I want to close with this, because this is really the biggie. We previewed it at the beginning, but I want to make sure we see this. So one of the common themes throughout the book of 1 Samuel is the contrast between Saul and David, between Saul and David. So David is off fighting, Saul is off fighting. And so it'd be nice if we could, and I'm not adept enough to do this sort of thing. Jeremy could do this. He could probably put up the different charts and he could show what's going on with Saul and back and forth. But I, but I spent some time thinking about this because the question is, who is qualified to lead God's people? And we know the answer is going to be David, but not necessarily, because even David's going to leave us wanting as we get to the end of 2 Samuel. But who can serve as king? Is Saul a legitimate king? Take for a moment off the table that he's from the tribe of Benjamin and that you have David who is from the tribe of Judah. You get a contrast between what these two folks are doing along the way. And so as it unfolds, you have the battle. David defeats the Amalekites. Saul is defeated by the Philistines in the next chapter. You still have to come. I mean, I know it's a bit of a spoiler alert, but that's what's going to happen. So you get David is victorious, but instead Saul is going to be defeated. Both of them seek supernatural guidance. They don't go to consult other humans. They don't say, hey, who's wise among you, right? 
Let me ask you, what do you think we should do? They both seek supernatural guidance. David, of course, consults with the Lord. Back in verse 7, he has Abiathar bring in the ephod, and he's going to test out what it is God would have them to do. He consults with God. Saul consults with the witch of Endor back in chapter 28. Now, to be fair, it's because God wasn't talking to him anymore because God had turned a deaf ear to the chap, but this is the contrast between the two. You have a prophecy. What is the prophecy that David gets? What's the message that David gets? God gets a word from the Lord about what's going to happen. Back in verse 8, he answered, God did, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake, and surely you shall surely rescue. Remember, you have a supernatural inquiry from Saul, and Saul wants to know, What's going to happen? If you go back to chapter 28, verse 19, he gets a word from the Lord as well. The Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons shall be with me. Remember, it's Samuel saying that. In other words, you and your sons will be dead. So you have David who gets victory and life in his words from the Lord, and Saul who gets defeat and death. And so there's this contrast that is brewing, and it's going to culminate, of course, at the end of chapter 31, moving into the next chapter where we'll make the transition from Saul to David. But we see here this blessed restoration as God uses David in such a way to accomplish his purposes with the Amalekites, but also to restore the fortunes of his people. So any questions, comments, or concerns from 1 Samuel 30? Okay, well, we don't, we don't have to run the clock out. That's all right, Gregory. Yes, sir. May I have plant some in their, in their audience next time? No one can snatch them from his hand, right? Yeah, that's a good, that, is, that is a good analogy. Very good. You have the uh, David and the son of David mirrored there. Glenn, did you have something as well? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and, and it, uh, the other thing to me is it's interesting how the, the narration of the story unfolds, right? So if you're, if you're one of those who likes, you know, adventure Western type shows, right, you like to see the guys riding on the horses, shooting the guns and shooting them backwards and this sort of thing. And you, and you get, you're kind of moving along and then you stop and it's an entirely different scene change where they're like putting food in this guy's mouth. You know, it really just kind of kills all the flow uh, of this section. It really stops down uh, before it, of course, picks back up again with a real thundering, uh, clobbering. Miss yeah. Deborah? So an ephod would be something that they would wear, that the priest would wear, it, it's a priestly garment. And you had the idea of the uh, Urim and Thummim who were like, we don't know all there is to know, but it seems like two different stones and somehow they would manipulate these or figure out by looking at them, kind of a dice or something would be a parallel in our day, not a magic eight ball per se, because we would not be advocating that, but that, that kind of idea, which is interesting because you have uh, David gets a, a, an audible um, return. Yeah. It's a good question because best we've seen, my assumption is that it is... Um, Basically, he asked the question, should I go to this? Should I pursue? Will we be victorious? And the answer comes out yes to that. Because as far as I see, you don't see David interacting. I mean, even when the Lord, the word of the Lord would come to David, it would come to him through, um, through Samuel. And later on, when he repents, sorry, at another time in the future, in chapter 12, the word of the Lord comes to him through Nathan, through a prophet. Yet at the same time, 
Scripture, like Peter in Acts 2, will refer to David as a prophet. You know, David himself, he will speak, you know, David acting as a prophet spoke of one other than himself, speaks of the Christ and the resurrection. So, But that's, that's kind of, I don't think we know for sure, but it reads that way, doesn't it? As though you hear an audible uh, voice coming to him. And the fact that they put it in quotes, of course, that's, you know, a translation uh, interpretation. But Glenn, and then Tommy? Mm. And then you look at this Second Kings, they struck them down for 24 hours. Yeah. I think part of it was they were getting uh, twilight all night. And they were doing that all day. And it's like all night and all day. And I just, this, this lake of fire spread from the Lord. You know, it's funny. I thought about this, and I didn't want to get too far afoul, uh, a field on it, but... I used to have a heavy bag that would hang in my garage, and I and I would tape up my hands, you know, with the tape. I would put it. Well, you, you'll, under, you'll you'll understand why for a moment. First of all, it gets hot in the garage, so if it's warm, I ain't going. But you know, you, you tape up your paws and all this kind of stuff, and then you put your gloves on. And you're out there, and you've you've seen Rocky. You see how easy this is, right? I mean, I'd set the thing for like 30, 30 uh, for excuse me, like for uh, three minutes. I mean, I'm like I'm hitting the bag after forty five seconds. I'm like. I'm tuckered out. I mean, so these guys that are fighting with swords and all this kind of stuff for that period of time, it's, it's phenomenal to think through. Now, granted, they're all in better shape than I am or even was, but um, yeah, I agree. Just the energy, you have to be endured from the Lord. And along those same lines, after they done this 48 hours of total torture, yeah. 400 young men didn't stay and beat them up. They got on their camels and ran away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so man for man. That's true. They, they, were ca- they ran away, right? Yeah. 400. Yeah, that's right. That's true. Yeah, you'd think they would have four of them just four hundred like in the uh, you know in the the karate movies, or they're just waiting for their turn, you know, to go fight. But they see what's going on, they skedaddle. That's a good point, Tommy. That's true. No, that's, that's a good point. That is a, that's a great observation. Absolutely. Pat? That's true. And they were hoping he would give it to Chuck. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, if they could have gotten their things and their family members back, they would have been content with that. But uh, you're right, they got the bonus. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Anna? I have a question. You said a long story about food stamps. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not just about the cakes in general, but just the, uh, the, the, the detail about what's going on there. And I think it has to do with... The, the way the story unfolds, you kind of feel like you're about to go to battle, but then it stops, and it really forces you to look at the provision. Uh, that So in my mind, they have this guy who they don't owe him anything, and he doesn't owe them anything, but they're being kind and they're being gracious to him, right? And so they're showing him favor. It winds up being beneficial for them, but in the same way you have God is favorable and, and shows them care and consideration as well. But I think she was hoping for a nutritional stamp. 
Uh, you know, that's a great question. I don't know. I, I have uh, I've had uh, fig newtons before, but uh, <laughs> not since my kid, not since the kids were toddlers. You know, so, yeah, I do not know. But I mean, it, to go back to uh, what what I forget who said it was. I mean, but it's not like they just said here's bread and water because that's all we have. I mean, it, it is interesting they have something that seems a little more ornate than that. So, good point. Anything else? That's true, yeah. Well, and it's got that natural sugar in it, right? The figs would kind of brighten you up a little bit, like honey. Oh, okay. Yeah, very good. Tommy? Okay. <laughs> Great minds. Do you have the same thing too, Lloyd? A farfig new, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, well, with that, uh, Judd, would you close us out by reading it one more time? So we read the beginning, we read it at the end, and then we'll pray, and then we'll be on our way. Now when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Midrash and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and burnt the women. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept unto the Lord, and no man spoke a word. David's two wives also had been taken captive, Ahinoam of Jezreel, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Shilonite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in spirit, each to his sons and daughters, but David strengthened his heart and was resolved. And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahinoam, bring me the ephah. So Abiathar brought the ephah to David. And David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue after this thing? Shall I overtake them? He answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake and shall surely win them. So David set out with 600 men who were with him. And they came to the brook Besor, where are those who were left behind in David pursued he and 400 men. 200 stayed behind who were too drunk to cross the brook Esau. They found an Egyptian in the open country and brought him to him. And they gave him bread and he ate. They gave him water to drink and they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and a few clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit revived. He did not eat bread or drunk wine for two days and three nights. And David said to him, sat with Shimon of Sapphira and against the Mika of Tema and he burned Ziklag with fire. And David said to him, Did you bring me down to this day? And he said, Swear to me by God that you will not kill me or deliver me from the hand of my master and I will take you down this day. And when he had taken him down, behold, it was spread abroad over all the land, eating and drinking and dancing so that of all the great spoil that was taken from Philistines and from the land of Judah. And David struck them down till twilight and till the evening the next day. And not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who went up to Tammuz and fled. David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken, and David rested a few days. Nothing was missing, neither small or great, son or daughter, spoil or anything that was his own. David brought back all. David also captured all the flocks and herds, and the people drove the livestock before him and said, This is David's spoil. Then David came to the 200 men who had been too drunk to follow David, and who had been left at the brook Esau. And they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near to the people, he greeted them. And all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone before him said, Because they did not go down with us, we are not to inherit any of the spoil that we have recovered, except that each man may lead away his wife and children from the flock. But David said, You shall not do so, my brothers, for this is your wickedness. You have preserved us and given into our hands a band of cannibalians. Who will listen to you in the future? But as 
his share is, he may have and be bound. Where shall his share be, which they have made him king? They shall stir him up. And that he made him statutes and rules for Israel from that day forth to this day. When David came to Ziklag, he took a part of the spoil for his friends, the elders of Judah, saying, Here's a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. It was for those of Bethel, and Ramoth, and Gilgad, and Machir, and Zor, and Ishmael, and Eshtemoth, and Rachel, and the cities of Jeruel, and the cities of the Kenites, and Hormah, and Gorsheb, and Ajah, and Tubal, for all the places that David and his men had made for him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, that which is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And we pray that you would help us to be built up, in particular, build up our faith in the son of David, uh, he who is the perfect one, even beyond being after your own heart, one whose food and drink was to do your will. And we thank you that he accomplished what could never have been done otherwise, that he rescued us and redeemed us, and he brought us back into relationship with you. All this we thank you for in Jesus' name. Amen. I was about to say, don't they style your brother? Yeah, I noticed he was having some allergy action on the way to church this morning. Well, last week he did the opposite. Yeah, last week he was morning and then guess not in the evening. Muzzle? Yeah, I think I do too. Yeah, I think I want to be a, a go homer. Not a stay homer, but a go homer. I can't give Jet the thing to give to the guy.